We are so blessed to have you, and it's our pleasure and honor to have you with us. Thank you for sparing your time to be with us and to share your knowledge for, for us to live better and to have a healthier life. And I'm sure all of us who are here this, this morning uh, will be blessed. And I, I don't know if it is afternoon in your place, but we are blessed to be here this morning. Uh, we would like to welcome all of you for this program. I hope that you will be blessed. And I hope that uh, the information that Dr. Manes will be sharing with us this morning will be a blessing in our life in the days to come. And with having said this, um, I would also like to just bring to the, uh, to, the, to the congregation or the group here, and that is India uh, is the EP center, the, the headquarter of diabetes in the world, unfortunately or fortunately, we are number one. And I think this, this, this seminar is so relevant to us. Recording in progress. And I'm sure that this will be such a blessing to all of us. And we will move on without or wasting much time. But Dr. Manes, we just want to let you know that we really appreciate your time and your, your effort and your, your willingness to be with us this morning. Thank you so much for being here. I hand over the time back to Brother Hame, who is the main organizer in, in, in collaboration with the church and the health ministry of Spice Adventist University. And I'm sure that there is so much that we can share. And I want to also inform the members present here this morning. Kindly uh, feel free to ask questions and clear your doubts at the end of the session of, after the presentation. You can drop in your question in the chat box or you can text me directly and then we will, we will place that to Dr. Manis and I'm sure that we will be enlightened with the answers. Yes, Brother Hami. Am I you didn't unmute or muted? Okay. okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Varikan, for that, those words of welcoming. Uh, this time, I'd like to welcome our senior church pastor, Pastor Van Altalonga, to kindly give us the opening prayer. Shall we offer words of prayer? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, the creator and the sustainer of this universe, thank you for manifold blessings you bestow upon us. We are truly grateful for them. Thank you for granting us a very good time today to meet and share our knowledge and time with one another in this seminar. May you extend your divine wisdom to our presenter, Dr. Johan Kim Timanes, so that he will be able to impart effectively God-given knowledge to all of us. May he be blessed as he continues to bring this expertise, his expertise to people who need them. Bless all the participants as well, so that we'd be able to understand and practice the vital information from today's activities. May you bestow your blessings upon our program today, so that when we go out, we will be, share, be able to share what we learn today to other people who need them. May all what we do today will be to glorify your name. This short prayer we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor, uh, for the prayer. Um, before we hand over the time to our presenter this morning, I'd just like to give a little uh, word of introduction uh, of who he is. Uh, Dr. Johan Kim T. Manes is a medical doctor by profession. Uh, he is engaged in many projects and works presently as the chief medical officer of the Four Leaf Lifestyle Medical Group. Uh, he is also the head doctor of the Doctor's Kitchen, which he is going to mention towards the end of his presentation as well. Uh, he is the executive director of the Asian Lifestyle Medicine Council. He is the director of the Physical Activity Association. Uh, he's also a medical exam writer of the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. 
He is a practicing consultant of the Four Leaf Lifestyle Medical Group Executive, uh, the director of the Philippines College of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, he's in the advisory board of the Lifestyle uh, Medicine Global Alliance and a board member of the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. These are just a few things that he has asked me to present about him, but he's engaged in so many other things. Uh, and we're so happy to have uh, Dr. Manes with us. He is married to um, Suzanne and father to Dizel, Dozer, and Dunzel. And in my short time knowing him when I was in the Philippines, I have found him to be a very humble, uh, friendly, uh, very down to earth kind of person. And most importantly, he is a God fearing person and one who loves a lot. He is actively engaged in health ministry and he wants to help people know about the truth of salvation through the health ministry. So we're very happy to have you here, uh, Dr. Manes, and the time is yours. So thank you very much. Um, this is my first time to be in India from the Philippines. <laughs> so I'm happy to be here with you guys. So let's go straight into the presentation. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen here. Get it right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're going to be talking about um, diabetes, which is one of the most common conditions that we have in uh, not just in the Philippines and in India, but the rest of the world. So I was just told a while ago that diabetes, um, the highest rates of diabetes are in India. You're the number one. Sometimes it's good to be number one, but for the right reasons, right? So that's not a good reason to be number one, uh, number one in diabetes. But the good news is uh, diabetes is completely reversible. Type two diabetes in particular is completely reversible. And this is uh, the message that I want to share with you uh, this morning in your place, afternoon in my place, so like two and a half hours difference. So I'd like to begin by uh, just showing you what I do as a, as a physician, as a medical doctor. My specialization is lifestyle medicine and lifestyle medicine is focused on six areas uh, to improve health. Uh, these areas are healthful eating, physical increasing physical activity, uh, managing stress, cessation of um, harmful substances like tobacco and alcohol, forming and maintaining good relationships, which is part of a healthy life, life a healthy lifestyle, and of course, improving sleep. Now, I'm sure as uh, since the majority of you are, are Adventists, you're very familiar with our New Start program. It's very similar to the New Start, but this is more of a medical approach. So in lifestyle medicine, everything we teach, everything we do for our patients is evidence-based. And a huge part of what we teach is really on nutrition. So the six, the we're, we're going, I'm going to be presenting um, a lot about nutrition because when it comes to diabetes, nutrition is the number one intervention we can do to begin with. And then of course we can, we can uh, insert the other uh, interventions uh, that we do for, for diabetic, um, for the diabetic population and diabetic patients that we have. So nutrition is, Number one, and then we'll, we're going to, uh, I guess to talk a little bit about exercise, okay? And about the other pillars of lifestyle medicine, as we call it, and how these relate to um, be staying healthy and becoming diabetes free. So diabetes uh, was actually discovered in 1910. That's a long time ago. Um, but since 1910, it was only recently that we were able to understand how diabetes actually happens, what is the main cause of the insulin resistance, as we call it, in diabetes that causes um, us to have increased sugar. Sorry, I thought somebody was asking a question there. Um, so, so diabetes was discovered in 1910. It was only recently that diabetes, the cause of diabetes was discovered. You know, since 1910, we've been trying to uh, help people with diabetes by controlling the sugar intake of the patients, right? Uh, but we've never, even no matter how hard we've tried to, to control the sugar intake, 
we've never really been able to cure diabetes. So, so the challenge uh, was to really identify what causes the insulin resistance in people who have type 2 diabetes. So as an overview, let me just show you the different types of diabetes that we have today. Uh, you're probably very familiar with type 2 diabetes, which is the most common diabetes. About 90% of people who are diabetic are type 2 diabetic. But we also have type 1 diabetes, which is what we call the juvenile diabetes because um, it is the young population who develops type 1 diabetes. This is more related to our intake of dairy products, okay? So there's a lot of studies that show that by taking dairy, like for example, in formula milk for babies, uh, when you introduce dairy at a very young age, uh, the proteins in milk are very similar to the proteins on the surface of the cells in your pancreas that produce insulin. So what happens is when you get exposed to these proteins in milk, uh, you develop antibodies against those proteins because they are foreign. And because they're very similar, the, ant the antigen or the protein is very similar to the protein on the surface of your, of your pancreatic beta cells, which produce insulin, our body starts to attack those um, cells as well and completely destroys those beta cells while you are a baby. So that as you get older, as you grow up, you can't produce insulin. So it's not about insulin resistance for type one diabetes. It's because you have no ability to produce insulin. So what, you, what these type one diabetics have to do is to inject exogenous sources of insulin or insulin from, from outside, if you wanna put it that way, that's what exogenous means. And you inject the insulin either on your arm, on your belly, where there's actually fat that <clears throat> can help uh, distribute the insulin throughout the body. And that's how type 1 diabetics survive, okay? There's also type 1.5 diabetes. Uh, these are what we call mature onset diabetes of the young. And the reason being is that type 1 diabetes, the, the pathology of type 1.5 diabetes is very similar to type 1 diabetes. The only difference is type 1 diabetes, you produce a lot of antibodies, different types of antibodies Okay, uh, we, we always produce a lot of antibodies, but in type 1 diabetes, there's different types of, of um, antibodies that you produce. Whereas in diabetes type 1.5, you only produce one type of antibody. So it takes a longer time to destroy the, the, um, the beta 2, the pancreatic beta 2 cells that produce the insulin. And that is why type 1.5 diabetes uh, is usually discovered at a later age, above 30 years old. Okay, so we either call it mature onset diabetes of the young or latent autoimmune diabetes in adults or LADA, Modi and LADA, okay? So that's type 1.5. And 1.5 diabetes was only discovered recently. So this is a new type of diabetes. Not everyone, even, even my endocrinologist friends and diabetologist friends and colleagues, they are very limited to the knowledge about 1.5 diabetes. The reason why I was able to discover this is because of lifestyle medicine. So we have a lot of researchers in our group, a lot of bio, biochemists who do this type of research and they've discovered um, 1.5 diabetes. So prediabetes, as the word, um, you know, when you look at the, the meaning of the word, prediabetes means before diabetes. So this is a period in time where your sugar is going up, your blood sugar is going up, but not as high uh, to the point as where we would diagnose you as a type 2 diabetic. So prediabetes is before uh, the, the diagnosis of diabetes. So it is at this point where we really want to help patients so that they don't get into full-blown diabetes, which of course uh, has its, um, I wouldn't call it side effects, but, but complications, okay? So type two diabetes is the most common diabetes. We're gonna be talking mostly about this. And then gestational diabetes is the diabetes that we find in mothers. Um, very similar, the, the pathology of type two diabetes is very similar to gestational diabetes. 
uh, but mostly you find it in people who are pregnant and uh, the hormones have a lot to do with it. You know, uh, female hormones tend to change as they get pregnant. So that has um, something to do with the increase in the blood, blood sugar as well. So again, for the longest time, we've been trying to um, control diabetic sugars by asking people who are diabetic not to eat sweet stuff, including wonderful mangoes like these, right? Uh, I understand in India, you have um, a different varieties of mangoes as well. Uh, we do so in the Philippines. We actually have a mango in the Philippines they call the Indian mango. But I don't think I've ever seen that mango in India, or at least, you know, my Indian friends uh, say that Indian mangoes in the Philippines uh, are, are, are different from the mangoes that you guys have in India. I don't know what's true, right? Um, but I think Dr. Hami uh, would know since you were in the Philippines. You know what? I can't even remember when, when we met here in the Philippines in AUP. It must have been just so long ago that I can't even remember until... You know, you told me that you were in the Philippines and that's where you, you met me anyways. So, so we, we ask people to avoid mangoes, avoid sweet fruits like, like oranges and other sweet fruits and other sweet food. Um, it's good that we, we can do that and we can try to control the blood sugars. But the ultimate goal is to really reverse the diabetes so that you won't even have to avoid these wonderful fruits that are sweet and that actually have a lot of nutrition. So let's dive into the studies and into the things that um, we need to discuss in order for us to understand what diabetes actually is and how we can reverse the most common type of, di type of diabetes, which is type two diabetes. So the diabetes trend since 1935, based on the Centers for Disease Control uh, in 2012, show that diabetes is a recent disease, okay? The, ep the epidemic, or even the pandemic, if you want to put it that way, the pandemic of diabetes throughout the world uh, increased all of a sudden in the 1970s, 1980s, as people uh, ate more uh, refined type of food. So the more modern our food got, the more diabetes we found or we discovered in, in, and diagnosed in society. And again, most of the diabetics are age 60 and above. So that is a 900% increase from the 1930s uh, to the 2000s, okay? So the normal diabetes, or, I mean, not normal diabetes, the normal blood sugar is between 60 and 100 milligrams per DL or three, three to six millimoles per liter. So pre-diabetes, as we mentioned earlier, is a blood sugar between 100 to 125 milligrams per DL. And once you um, go beyond 125, then we diagnose you with diabetes, okay? Once your sugar uh, goes above 125, then you have uh, type two diabetes or diabetes in general. Then we have to identify what type of diabetes uh, you actually have. So <clears throat> the symptoms of diabetes are uh, thirst, you're always thirsty. We call that uh, polydipsia. You always go to the bathroom to urinate. That means uh, you have polyuria. And you always want to eat. That's called polyphagia. So, so, so these are the three main symptoms of diabetes. And once uh, you have that, um, you should probably get checked. Your blood sugar should probably get checked because uh, you need to be able to uh, determine whether you do have or you are developing uh, a type of diabetes. So if you also have blurred vision, that could also be a, um, a symptom of diabetes, but this is more of a late symptom when you already have the complications uh, because diabetes is a very serious condition that causes other conditions to happen as well. Uh, diabetes can cause uh, fatigue, can cause weakness. And of course, eventually, as a diabetic, if you are diagnosed with diabetes, then you will have to take medications. Uh, so we, we know and we understand that diabetes is the mother of all diseases. It is the number one cause of blindness 
of kidney disease for you who are guys impotent. Okay, that's not a good thing to have. A non-accidental amputation. So we know that uh, diabetics develop um, diabetic legs or feet. And when there's no blood circulation to the feet, then of course they have to cut off the feet in order to save the rest of the body. Because if your feet is dead, if your foot is dead and it's still attached to you, then it could cause um, sepsis, which is a really bad infection. So we amputate people's feet because of diabetes. Uh, there's also an increased risk of developing heart disease when you have diabetes, an increased risk of stroke, in fact, two to four times more uh, risk than a regular person. And it causes hearing loss as well. And essentially, diabetes cuts your lifespan by about 12 to 13 years. So if you want to live 12 to 13 years longer, you want to be able to address your diabetes, reverse it as soon as possible, and of course, live a very healthy life. So it also increases, of course, your medical bills, right? I mean, no, nobody wants to get sick, but if you get, do get diabetes because you need to take medications and uh, because eventually you'll have to uh, treat the, the complications of diabetes, then it's a very expensive disease as well. And of course, we now know that it is no longer sustainable to the point where patients would just, you know, just forget, they, they would just tell the doctors, forget it, I can't afford these treatments and medications and, uh, you know, just let me be. And of course, they eventually develop complications and then people die, which is really sad because diabetes is completely reversible, as we will find out. So um, Dr. James Anderson, he's a professor of medicine and clinical nutrition at the University of Kentucky. Okay, So he has been uh, into research of diabetes for a long time. He says that 50 to 70% of diabetics on insulin, 80 to 90% of those on pills could normalize their blood sugars and be off their medications within weeks if they change their diet. And so we're going to be focusing a lot on how to eat to reverse diabetes. Okay, so this study shows that diabetes, uh, this study from the uh, National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, in Atlanta says that diabetes has been inexorably advancing, doubling every 20 years. So that is a concern. And the chance of becoming a diabetic in America, for example, for a newborn baby in a lifetime is now one in three. And since India is the number one country in terms of diabetes, you probably have a, a, a worse um, kind of statistics. I'm imagining, if you guys know about it, please tell me. But right now, uh, the data I have is, is, is from the US, okay? We have no medical cure at the moment for diabetics. And that is why lifestyle medicine is so essential. So one and three people, well, as soon as they're born, one in three people have a chance to, to develop uh, type two diabetes. And we now know the cause. The cause of type two diabetes is our unhealthy habits, okay? Our unhealthy lifestyles, eating lots of processed foods and simple sugars is also an inc uh, increases your risk for, for type two diabetes. We have to understand that we have around 60,000 miles or close to 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels. So these are uh, the blood vessels that supply blood and nutrients to all the parts of our body. The main nutrient that the blood supplies our body is glucose. So do we need blood sugar? Absolutely, we need glucose. So glucose is what fuels, uh, what fuel is to your car. So glucose in our bodies is what fuel is to your car. It runs our machinery, it runs your cells. But in order for the glucose to get inside your cells from the blood, uh, a special organ in your body called the pancreas, I already mentioned it earlier, has to get into action. So the sugar is in the blood, okay? And this sugar is what fuels our body and allows our human machinery to actually happen. So without sugar, we can't think. Without sugar in our blood, we can't 
or at least in our cells, we can't move. We need sugar because that is the main energy source of our bodies. So the pancreas has these cells, we call beta cells in the pancreas, okay? And these secrete insulin. So from the pancreas, the insulin is secreted into the bloodstream and the insulin acts like a key to our cells. When there is, uh, when, when you eat, okay, after eating, uh, your, the, the, the receptors in your stomach tell your brain that there's food. And as you eat, this food is absorbed, is digested and absorbed into your blood as glucose. And that glucose needs to get inside the cell in order for you to be able to uh, produce ATP. ATP is our energy. It's our currency, energy currency in our bodies. So let's show insulin as keys, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. So your pancreas creates create the insulin. The insulin is uh, brought by the circulatory system into your bloodstream. Normally, the insulin will attach to these keyholes on your cells that we call insulin receptors. And there's a cascade of chemical reactions that will open these glucose channels or doors to allow glucose to come into your cells. Okay, so these are happening on the surface of your cells. So this right here is a representation of your muscle cell. And so in order for the glucose, so glucose are these uh, six starred um, uh, figures here, <laughs> or asterisks if you want to call it, that uh, go into your cell, and then the glucose is used to create ATP or energy. Okay. So for type one diabetics, there is no insulin. So there is zero insulin produced by your your pancreas, and that's why oh, type one. Diabetes. <laughs> Okay, is it all right for you guys to, to mute your, your microphone so that uh, we, I mean, if you, if you wanna ask questions, we can reserve those questions towards the end. Let me just, just finish this presentation real quick. So um, type one diabetes, uh, as I was saying, you don't produce any insulin. So there are no keys from your pancreas that will open these channels. And that's very important because uh, type 1 diabetics have to be injected. So the insulin has to be from the outside because your pancreas doesn't create um, the, the, your pancreas doesn't create the keys or the insulin to open those, those glucose channels. And that's why the sugar keeps rising in your bloodstream because it can't enter the cells. So with type 2 diabetes, um, usually type 2 diabetics are uh, overweight, okay? Uh, their pancreas works extremely well. Uh, what happens sometimes is the pancreas even goes into overdrive. But the problem is not the insulin. It's not the pancreas that is the problem. It is these keys, okay? The key, not keys, um, key holes, okay? So the insulin receptors are the problem. It is, in layman's terms, they are clogged up with stuff, okay? So in this case, what we now know that clogs up these receptors and prevents the cascade of reactions in our cell that eventually open these glucose channels. Uh, and I will show you that in a different, um, in a video presentation later. The culprit we now know is actually fat in our muscle cells or what we call intramyocellular lipid. So some of the receptors are okay, right? Some receptors are gummed up. So there's very little uh, glucose that is entering our cells and that is what increases the sugar in our bloodstream when we are type two diabetics, okay? So that is what happens. Uh, again, there is no problem with the pancreas. Your pancreas is working fine. It's just these receptors that are the problem. So in order to control the blood sugar, uh, doctors place their patients on insulin injections or diabetic pills. And this is what helps bring the sugar down so that the patient doesn't develop the complications of high blood sugar. 
uh, when you have high blood sugar, uh, it actually creates injury on the lining of your blood vessels. And that is why when people are diabetic, they, they, they speed up the process of atherosclerosis, which is uh, the buildup of plaque in your, in your arteries, in your veins that cause heart attacks when they're completely blocked or strokes when they're completely blocked in the head, okay? So this is, this is why atherosclerosis speeds up when you are diabetic. And it's very dangerous because the number one killer in our world today is cardiovascular diseases or uh, diseases of the cardiovascular system, okay? Like heart disease and stroke. And because people have high blood sugar, the recommended diet, okay, the, the diet that they recommend is a diet high in protein and fat uh, and very low in carbohydrates, very low in sugars. And what we now know is that these high protein diets that are recommended by our diabetes organizations of, around the world actually increase the harm to the kidneys and to the liver. So it increases the risk for developing kidney disease and liver disease. And remember, when you have diabetes, diabetes already puts your kidneys at risk. And then what they recommend are high protein diets. Then you add more problems. You add more problems to the kidneys. And so your kidneys actually um, give way a lot earlier than you would if you just let the diabetes keep up, keep, keep, you know, keep. Um, destroying the kidneys slowly over time. So again, I mentioned it also increases the, uh, you already have diabetes. So diabetes itself increases your risk for developing atherosclerosis, but the protein that they recommend in diabetic diets also uh, increase the rate of developing atherosclerosis because of all the cholesterol in these high protein animal based foods. Okay. So I don't recommend the regular recommendation when it comes to di diets for diabetics. And I will show you why, and I'll show you how and how we should eat in order for us not only to control or even prevent diabetes from happening, but we can actually reverse the whole process of diabetes. So I don't know how many of you are diabetic, but maybe is, is it okay to have a poll? of the people who are listening to me that are diet type two diabetics, that would be great if, if the organizers could, could create a poll. I'm pretty sure that you can create a poll in, um, in, in this Zoom uh, application. But uh, for now, uh, let me just talk a little bit more about uh, diabetes and how doctors are able to control diabetes. So since two, 1910, as I mentioned, We've been trying to control diabetes with, with controlling sugar. Uh, now that we have pharmaceutical agents, we give patients with diabetes insulin. We give patients with, with diabetes uh, pills. But the main reason people have type 2 diabetes is because they eat too much fatty food. And today, with our modern society, more and more people are eating fatty food and it manifests in, you know, the fat or the, how people are getting fatter and bigger in society today. Uh, obesity has increased and no amount of pills, unfortunately, are able to um, control, to reverse, not just control, but reverse type two diabetes and help people cure themselves from diabetes. So the main culprit is food. Food is the main culprit. Uh, and I'd like to show you some of the evidence of this. So the prevalence of diabetes in Japan for adults over 40 years of age before in 1960s was just 1%. Okay. And in 19, between 1960 to 1980, it jumped from 1% of the population to 5% of the population. And from 1980, just look at this, just 20 years later, from 1980 to 2000, from 6% to 12%. So huge leaps in 
uh, the prevalence of diabetes in Japan. And we understand that Japan is supposed to be a very healthy country. In fact, the longest lived people in the world are found in Okinawa, Japan. And this is alarming. And this is why we have to keep, we have to discover the real reason for developing diabetes and stop diabetes in its tracks. Uh, today, it is close to 25% of the population in Japan. So one in four people in Japan, adult people in Japan have diabetes. So let's look at history and how uh, diabetes increase or, or diabetes, we think diabetes developed. So in the 1950s, 1960s, fat consumption was very low and um, carbohydrate consumption was very high. So we're talking about sugar here, complex and simple carbohydrates, okay? As the fat consumption increased, we also noticed that the carbohydrate consumption decreased. And if we relate that to this information, this information, so it means that the more fat people were eating, the more diabetes people developed, right? And this is in the general population. I know there is not no direct cause and effect. We can only uh, assume that, especially with these, with these epidemiologic studies, we can only assume that it is the fat consumption versus the carbohydrate consumption that is causing diabetes. But today we are getting more and more information. In fact, a daily 40 gram increase in fat increases the risk of becoming a diabetic by six times. So 40 gram increase of fat in your food increases your risk of developing diabetes by 600%. So that's a huge percentage risk of developing diabetes. And we find all that fat in our modern food, in our pizzas, right? In our cakes, in all of these um, modern type diets that are laden with fat. Um, India used to have very healthy food. I mean, I love Indian food, uh, but at home uh, and with, because of the influence of some of my Indian friends who are also very health conscious, they told me that um, Indian food didn't used to be fatty. It was only until uh, you were able to produce or actually acquire lots of fat from the industrial, from, from the industries, uh, the food industry that, uh, Indian food was, became a lot, uh, became more fatty. And that's probably why in India, there are a lot of type two diabetics. So, so, so just to help you understand how diabetes, type two diabetes works, uh, I want to show you a video from my mentor, Dr. Uh, my, Michael Greger, who is one of the, you know, one, when, it, when it comes to information about nutrition, He's one of the authorities, one of the experts in nutrition. And he have, even has his own website called nutritionfacts.org. So let me just share with you this video. Uh, it's quite short. I think it's around three, four or five minutes. Uh, just to give you an idea, a uh, more solid idea of how type 2 diabetes and diabetes in general works. Okay, so please listen carefully. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I was supposed to show you a, a video on online. Okay, so this is Dr. Michael Greger. insulin resistance. Let me just really quickly uh, show you the video. Here we go. Studies dating back nearly a century noted a striking finding. If you take young Young, healthy people split them up into two groups, half on a fat-rich diet and half on a carb-rich diet. Within just two days, this is what happens. 
the glucose intolerance skyrockets in the fat group. In response to the same sugar challenge, the group that had been shoveling in fat ended up with twice the blood sugar. As the amount of fat in the diet goes up, so does our blood sugar spikes. Why would eating fat lead to higher blood sugar levels? It would take scientists nearly seven decades to unravel this mystery, but it would end up holding the key to our current understanding of the cause of type 2 diabetes. The reason athletes carb load before a race is to build up the fuel supply within their muscles. Right? We break down the starch into glucose in our digestive tract. It circulates as blood glucose, also known as blood sugar, and is taken up by our muscles to be stored and burned for energy. Blood sugar, though, is like a vampire. It needs an invitation to come into our cells, and that invitation is insulin. Here's a muscle cell. Here's some blood sugar outside waiting patiently to come in. Insulin is the key that unlocks the door to let sugar in our blood enter the muscle cell. When insulin attaches to the insulin receptor, it activates an enzyme, which activates another enzyme, which activates two more enzymes, which finally activates glucose transport, which acts as a gateway for glucose to enter the cell. So insulin is the key that unlocks the door into our muscle cells. What if there was no insulin, though? Well, blood sugar will be stuck out in the bloodstream, banging on the door to our muscles, and not be able to get inside. And so with nowhere to go, sugar levels would rise and rise. That's what happens in type 1 diabetes. The cells in the pancreas that make insulin get destroyed, and without insulin, sugar in the blood can't get out of the blood and into the muscles, and blood sugar rises. But there's a second way we could end up with high blood sugar. What if there's enough insulin, but the insulin doesn't work? The key is there, but something, something's gummed up the lock. This is called insulin resistance. Our muscle cells become resistant to the effect of insulin. What's gumming up the door locks in our muscle cells, preventing insulin from letting sugar in? Fat what's called intramyocellular lipid, fat inside our muscle cells. Fat in the bloodstream can build up inside the muscle cell, creating toxic fatty breakdown products and free radicals that can block the signaling pathway process. So no matter how much insulin we have out in our blood, it's not able to open the glucose gates and blood sugar levels build up in the blood. This mechanism by which fat induces insulin resistance wasn't known until fancy MRI techniques were developed to see what was happening inside people's muscles as fat was infused into their bloodstream. That's how we found out that elevation of fat levels in the blood causes insulin resistance by the inhibition of glucose transport into the muscles. And this can happen within three hours. One hit of fat can start causing insulin resistance, inhibiting glucose uptake after just 160 minutes. Same thing happens to teens. You infuse fat into their bloodstream, it builds up in their muscles and decreases their insulin sensitivity, uh, showing that increased fat in the blood is an important contributor of insulin resistance. And then you can do the opposite experiment lower the level of fat in people's blood, and the insulin resistance comes right down. Clear the fat out of the blood, and you can clear the sugar out of the blood. So that explains this finding. On a high-fat, ketogenic diet, insulin doesn't work very well. Our bodies become insulin resistant. But as the amount of fat in our diet gets lower and lower, insulin works better and better. This is a clear demonstration that the sugar tolerance of even healthy individuals can be impaired by administering a low-carb, high-fat diet. But we can decrease insulin resistance by decreasing fat intake.
Okay, there we go. I wasn't able to unmute myself. So were you able to see the video? Because somebody just messaged waiting for the video, sir. Were you able to actually watch the video? Yes, we can see it. Okay, you saw the video. Okay, great. So, so I hope that that video actually helped us understand how diabetes works, okay, in general. So uh, let me just show you a few more studies from the nurse's health study, for example. Those at the highest end of the weight scale, so we're talking about uh, people who are overweight and obese, develop diabetes at 40 times higher frequency than those at the lower weight end. So another risk factor for developing diabetes is uh, obesity or overweight. That's something we want to watch out for. Um, the theory is that when you're obese, when you're overweight, you have a lot of fat stores. It's because of all those fat stores uh, that also um, cause the same mechanism that we showed a while ago in the video. So fat is the culprit for developing diabetes. Uh, there is what we call the National Diabetes Prevention Program. And in this program, reduction in the incidence of type 2 diabetes with lifestyle intervention or metformin was a study that they did. And for the placebo, they had a 29% increase, okay? Uh, with medication, uh, they brought the diabetes down to 22%. And with lifestyle, they brought the diabetes down to 14%. So there is a 58% benefit just by using lifestyle compared to medication. We also have um, the Adventist Health Study 2. And in this study, four ounces or 113 grams of unprocessed meat, okay? We're talking about red meat, like beef, okay? Like, I don't know if you guys eat goat, but in the Philippines, we eat goat. <laughs> and by eating meat, unprocessed red meat, it increased the diabetes risk by 20%. We now understand why and that is because meat is also very high in saturated fat. And remember, fat is what causes diabetes type 2, not sugar. It only took 2 ounces or 60 grams of processed red meat. So remember, this is unprocessed, okay? 4 ounces or 113 grams to increase the diabetes risk by 20%. But when you, when you eat processed meat, you even need less Okay, there was only two ounces of processed red meat per day to increase the diabetes risk by 50%. So this is why if people actually want to eat meat, what we'd rather recommend is whole meat or red meat than processed red meat. But again, there still is a risk uh, for developing diabetes when you eat meat, and that is why we don't recommend eating meat at all especially if you want to reverse your diabetes. So what we do recommend is plant-based whole food, like whole grains, for example, and vegetables. Replacing one daily serving, just one daily serving of processed meat with a whole grain dish, like let's say, when I say whole grain, I mean the grain still has the bran portion and the germ portion of the grain. So we're not talking about white rice, we're talking about um, uh, unpolished rice. We're not talking about corn flakes. We're talking about the whole corn kernel, okay? Corn on a cob, still, still whole with the bran, with the germ in it. So whole grain dish, uh, the diabetes risk dropped by up to 35% just by replacing one serving. Okay? Imagine if, you know, all your food was just whole grains and, and, and plant-based foods, what that would mean to your uh, risk of developing diabetes. <clears throat> so we now know that processed meats, especially are the number one culprit in developing diabetes. But just because you eat a vegetarian diet or a plant-based diet, if you still use a lot of oil in your food, remember the culprit for developing diabetes is fat. Okay, fat is what causes diabetes. So even if you're a vegetarian and you eat rice and vegetables, if you use a lot of oil in your food, then you still increase your risk for developing type two diabetes. So again, the three 
possible mechanisms for developing type 2 diabetes, we have weight gain. We have the toxic effect of uh, nitrosamines on the pancreatic beta cells. So nitrosamines, these are found in uh, processed meats because the nitrosamines uh, work as a uh, preservative for the meat. That's why you keep the meat nice and pink when you put nitrosamines. Unfortunately, nitrosamines will also destroy your pancreatic beta cells, which eventually will cause you not just to have type two diabetes, but type one diabetes as well. We call that double diabetes, which is the worst kind of diabetes you want to get. So oxidative stress, again, from the iron in meat, and we now understand the fat in the food that we eat is uh, the main culprit. So this is this um, lecture of mine was actually done before a long time ago. So this is before we actually discovered that it was fat that was the culprit. So the studies of fat was was recent, was pretty recent. Uh, it was only when they developed uh, the magnetic resonance imaging that they were specifically able to identify that fat was the main culprit. But before that, it was these three possible mechanisms. Now we know better. Now we know that it is fat in our food that we eat that causes insulin resistance. So all these meat, all these fatty and sweet foods, by the way, will, you know, uh, if you have simple sugars, you already have the fat from frying the donut, for example, will cause the insulin resistance. And then all that simple sugar will not help either. So what we do recommend are foods that are natural. Uh, if you want something sweet, eat sweet fruits. They are high in complex carbohydrates, but they are very low in fat. And compli complex carbohydrates are important because they don't uh, break down as fast. They don't get absorbed as fast into your bloodstream. So you won't have these sugar spikes that come along with drinking soda, for example, or for, for when eating donuts or processed sweets. So these are the foods that we want to encourage people to eat. Whole plant-based foods because they are very low in fat and they are very high in fiber and complex carbohydrates that helps us uh, pretty much control the sugar in our blood. So what we need to do today is really to educate people about diabetes. So read about diabetes, attend diabetic classes, ask questions, especially to your doctors, especially to your lifestyle medicine doctors. You have a bunch of lifestyle medicine doctors now in India, which is really good. That means they will be able to help you guys um, uh, reverse your type two diabetes. Uh, make sure you discuss diabetes with, with your, with your uh, co-diabetic friends and relatives in order for you to be able to um, reverse it eventually, okay? So again, just as a review, symptoms of diabetes, frequent urination, feeling thirsty, increased appetite, blurred vision, always feeling fatigued or tired. And you also have to be aware that when you are diabetic, uh, you have to make sure that your heart is functioning well, that you don't have plaque buildup in your heart, which will, of course, increase your risk for developing heart disease and getting a heart attack. Uh, you want to watch your kidney function. You have to get blood tests for kidney function so that uh, you know that your kidneys are still functioning properly. You want to get your eyes checked. You always want to protect your feet because if you're diabetic, uh, the blood supply to the legs are usually compromised. And this is what causes um, gangrene in people with diabetic foot. And of course, that would mean uh, you would have to get your foot cut off uh, if you're, if it comes to the point where you develop gangrene on your foot because of diabetic foot. So in 1955, uh, Dr. Inder Singh, that sounds kind of, I don't know, is that like an Indian name, Inder Singh, uh, took 80 patients on insulin and prescribed an, a 11 calories, 11% uh, calories from fat and a very natural, more plant-based diet. These are 80 patients, full-blown diabetics, okay? 50 out of 80 were off insulin in just six weeks. And another 
18 were off insulin in 18 weeks. So all you have to do is cut away the fat from your diet. And there was an 85% success rate. So they did a similar study, but this time among the, the modern Aborigines in Australia. So what they did was they got these diabetic Aborigines in Australia, and they asked them, look, go back into the bush and live as the original diet, live as the original Aborigines lived, you know, still eating some type of meat, but mostly they would, uh, they would um, gather root crops as their main meal. Uh, they would have some meat, lean meat from these kangaroos that they would kill and hunt for, but most of their food were complex carbohydrates. So their food was generally very low in fat, very high, high in complex uh, carbohydrates. And there was a marked improvement in carbohydrate metabolism in these um, Australian aborigines. In fact, from 209 milligrams per DL, they went down to 119. So 209 is very high when it comes to blood sugar, okay? And after seven weeks, they all became pre-diabetic. So their, their, their blood sugar levels came down to 119, which is pre, the pre, a pre-diabetes uh, level, okay? So at the end of this four-week residential lifestyle program, so this is another study, uh, there was a lifestyle medicine program that was done on these diabetics. 76% of the participants were off their oral medications and 44% were off their insulin. This is the power of lifestyle medicine for people with diabetic diabetes. Within less than three weeks, 22 of their patients were off their insulin, and the remaining six had their insulin reduced from 28 units to 14 units in the same time frame. So these are people reversing their, their diabetes, coming, their sugars coming down, and their need for medications uh, going away. Some 50 to 75% of type 2 diabetics on insulin and 80 to 90% of those on pills could normalize their blood sugars and be off medication within weeks, according to Professor or Dr. James Anderson, who we uh, mentioned earlier. There's other programs for diabetes, such as Dr. Neil Bernard's uh, Reversing Diabetes Program. This is actually the program that I use for my patients. Uh, he is a real person, by the way. I, you know, just to prove to you, I got a picture taken with him during one of our conferences in lifestyle medicine in the U.S., the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Another good friend and uh, colleague of mine is Dr. Wes Youngberg. He is also a lifestyle medicine specialist, and he has his book, Goodbye Diabetes. Again, the same principles, low-fat diet, high carbohydrates, high plant content of food, and you can reverse diabetes. That's him there in another of our conferences in the United States. And if you're not familiar with the Complete Health Improvement Program, this is a program by Dr. Hans Deal. We've been doing this program here in the Philippines for quite a while now. And um, we even uh, published a study on people who were on this program. And again, in this program, we teach people how to cook without using oil. So you can fry without oil. Can you, did, did you know that? Uh, by using air fryers, for example, you can, you can even saute without oil. You can create soups without oil. And by doing that, we can reverse diabetes. So we published a paper in uh, the Asian Pacific Journal of Health Sciences. It's a peer reviewed journal. And uh, one of the contributors to the data was our department, the Adventist Medical Center, Manila here in the Philippines, and uh, that's my name. I'm very happy that you know some of these, some of these um, uh, very important studies in reversing um, diabetes can is now available uh, to the general public. And this is education. We can educate the public and show them that these programs work and that diabetes is reversible and give them hope because people with diabetes, you know. They think that, okay, I have diabetes. I'm probably going to die from diabetes. That's not true anymore. You don't need to die from diabetes or the complications of diabetes because we can reverse diabetes type 2.
So in the, in the presentation, in the, the article that we did, we were able to decrease uh, fasting blood sugars of the test subjects, the people who are in the study by as much as 12.4%. This is a before and after of um, their, their, their fasting blood sugar. So this is huge. This is a huge decrease in blood sugars. Um, what we need today are doctors and health uh, personnel, health uh, educators to teach people how to eat right, how to exercise, okay, how to uh, live a healthy lifestyle. Remember, exercise can also decrease your need for insulin, decrease your need for medications because by doing exercise, uh, we have aerobic exercise, we have strength building exercises. By doing strength building exercises, for example, your body doesn't even need insulin to get the sugar into your muscles. That's how wonderful exercise can help you bring down your blood sugars uh, by virtue of, I don't know, compression of the muscles against the blood vessels. You're able to force uh, blood glucose into your muscles just by exercising. So again, nutrition is number one because according to Dr. Stanley Kahn and Dr. Friedrich Stare of the Harvard School of Public Health, nutrition is the most important single environmental factor affecting health. This means you can never uh, out exercise, or you can never over exercise uh, to, to neutralize or to, I'd say, um, yeah, neutralize the ill effects of a bad diet. If your diet is bad, then no matter how much you exercise, you can still develop chronic diseases that kill, by the way, up to 71% of society today. The majority of people in the world who die, die from chronic diseases. So as I would tell my patients, you know, don't be afraid of COVID. COVID is not the number one killer in the world. It is still chronic diseases. In fact, COVID-19, as just as a little sidetrack, COVID-19, if you get it, you have a 99.98% chance of recovering. It's almost, you know, like the flu. And uh, this is why I, I am mind boggled by why the world is going into chaos by a disease that is uh, almost as just as deadly as the flu. I mean, nobody panics about the flu. Why panic about COVID-19, right? So guys, if you want to, to learn or to eat your way into health, eat your way out of diabetes, this is the best way to eat. If you forget everything I say, please do not, any, anything I say from the, the lecture, please do not forget this power plate diagram. This is, uh, this was put together by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in, um, in uh, 19, no, no, 2009. Okay, so 1991, they discovered the four food groups, the fruits, grains, beans, and vegetables as the food that human beings should be eating. These are not Christians. These are not Seventh-day Adventist Christians. These are hardcore scientists and medical doctors, uh, researchers who discovered that what human beings should be eating is a plant-based whole food diet. Uh, and this is one reason uh, why um, one of my patients approached me as I practice lifestyle medicine and taught people how to cook and eat. And he said, doc, you know, you should use the information you have and you should provide a food service in the Philippines for people who can't, or who are so busy that they can't cook for themselves. Uh, this is the gap that he thinks is the gap between uh, what we teach in lifestyle medicine and how people can actually apply these things and eat the right type of food. So. This is, this is the brainchild, this, the doctor's kitchen pH is a brainchild of one of my patients, can you imagine that? He partnered with me and said, doc, we need to open this up. We need to provide food that is accessible to the public so they can actually reverse their diabetes. And since uh, last year, we have been providing this food for people. We have been able to reverse the diabetes of a lot of our patients. And some people just want to eat healthy. You know, they don't have any disease. They just want to eat healthy. 
So we developed this program. And I hope in, in India, some of you who are listening and some of the leaders who are organizing this, this talk will be able to come together and provide something like this for your population. Uh, food that is cooked without oil, very low in fat, plant-based whole foods uh, that can help not only prevent diabetes, but also reverse uh, diabetes in your society. So I'd like to end with that slide. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you have any um, questions or if you want to contact me or you know, uh, reach out to me, these are my contact details. Thank you very much. Have a healthy day. Um, thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for that very informative session. Uh, this time we'll hand yeah. over the time to Dr. Varekan for the question and answer sessions. And we have a few questions I think that needs to be addressed. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Dr. Manes, for your wonderful presentation. I think uh, all of us present here this morning in the platform is blessed and well informed about diabetes and how we should care and how we should prevent. But at the same time, if we are one in the group, how to reduce the, the chances of complicating the issue. So thank you so much for, for your presentation. And I think we have a number of questions here. We will go through one by one. Some of them are already there in the chat box. Some of them have been sent to me directly. And therefore, okay. we shall get into that directly, isn't it? Without wasting much time. And so question number one is, how do we define in a very simple way, what is unhealthy lifestyle? Oh, wow. Never thought of defining an unhealthy lifestyle, but yeah. Um, you see, there are aspects of our lifestyle, right? There's different aspects of our lifestyle. So I guess a definition of an unhealthy lifestyle would be eating processed animal-based types of food. When I say processed, okay, that includes oil because oil is processed. You don't have oil naturally just dripping off a, a leaf or, or, or the bark of trees, right? You have to extract oil from food. So oil is a processed food. Number two, if you're not exercising, if you're not moving as much, then that is also part of an unhealthy lifestyle. We have muscles and bones and, you know, limbs and joints because we are designed to move. And when we don't move, that causes our bodies to change our metabolism. It becomes slower. It becomes uh, more, uh, I would say, um, uh, when you don't move, you don't improve circulation. You don't keep your blood flowing properly to certain parts of the body. And that is also part of an unhealthy lifestyle. Another thing is stress, okay? Uh, when we get when we get overly stressed, and the thing is, uh, stress is something that we experience. If we didn't have you know these office jobs, we would be out in the field, right? We would be we would be uh, farming, we would be uh, hunting. But stress is there. If we were in a natural uh, environment, stress is there to help us either fight danger or flee from danger but if we're having stress in an office we're not exactly fighting your work right you're not fleeing from your work you're just sitting down on your computer typing away so stress should have a physical response and that's why stress and exercise are very connected the more stressed you are the more physical activity you need in order to battle stress and so having stress and not moving is also part of an unhealthy lifestyle not sleeping eight hours in the evening is also part of a very unhealthy lifestyle. So, you know, we can't just have one definition of un unhealthy lifestyle. There's so many aspects of lifestyle that if you don't take care of it, you can fall ill and you can develop um, disease. So definitely sleeping is something we have to do eight hours in the evening. Uh, other things like drinking a lot of water is also good. Okay, so, so all these aspects of lifestyle, avoiding unhealthy substances like smoking and alcohol or drugs, even processed foods. So, so it's very broad. You can be unhealthy in so many ways. 
And this is why we need education. Education is truly the key. And lifestyle medicine is, is really an important part of helping individuals get educated when it comes to keeping yourself healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Question number two here is, why do we feel so sleepy after we eat food? Can it be a sign of having diabetes? Um, not really. But if your food is very high in fat, absolutely. You can actually cause yourself to become sleepy. And the reason is, I don't know how you guys um, wash dishes, but in, in, in Britain, we stayed in, in Scotland uh, for a number of years. In the UK, okay, how they wash dishes is uh, they, they put, they fill up the sink with soapy water, all right? Well, well, first they rinse off the food from the plates and then they fill up the sink with soapy water and then they dip the plate in the soapy water and then they pull it up and then wipe it off and then put it on the shelf. I know it's, for me, it is kind of unhygienic because I think you have to rinse the plate afterwards after soaping it, right? And one thing we notice is if the food is very high in fat, when you lift up the plate, it's coated with fat, right? It's coated with fat because of all the grease from the food. Now, imagine all that food going into your system. I don't know if you guys know what a red blood cell looks like. Do you know what a red blood cell? I showed you a picture, by the way. A red blood cell is kind of like a plate, right? It's round and it's thin. When you eat a lot of fat, the fat is absorbed into your blood system, in your, in, into your blood, and it coats your blood, your red blood cells. And your red blood cells needs to be free from oil, from coating, in order to give you oxygen. So the red blood cells helps you exchange carbon dioxide from your body, oxygen from your lungs, and to keep you awake. When it's coated with oil, the blood exchange is very poor. So you get very poor oxygenation, and that's why you feel sleepy after a very fatty meal, okay? I hope, you, I, hope I was able to um, uh, explain that clearly. When there's very little oxygen in the blood, then your brain doesn't have enough oxygen, and then you start feeling sleepy. So if you're feeling sleepy after a meal, that means your meal is very high in fat. Right. Thank you. That's quite interesting. Uh, we move yeah. on. I think uh, there are a few questions which I have just put together here because they are all related. That is, how do we relate? I think, doctor, you have emphasized a lot on consumption of fat. But the mm -hmm. questions now is, how do we relate fat, sugar, and salt together when it comes to diabetes? Okay, I can, so what I can say is, uh, of course, uh, there's a lot of other conditions that are increased in, ter in terms of your risk of developing them. When you eat a lot of salt, when you eat, eat a lot of fat, and when you eat a lot of sugar. So when you eat a lot of uh, salt, uh, you can develop um, hypertension. We know there's a direct connection between the amount of salt you take in and the blood pressure. Another thing, if you eat too much salt, you can also develop kidney stones. So when it comes to salt, the limit for one whole day to keep yourself healthy is one teaspoon of salt for the whole day, especially for people for, who are hypertensive. In fact, for hypertensive people, uh, I ask them to cut the, the limit, so half a teaspoon only. But for the general population, if you limit your salt to, to one teaspoon a day, uh, that will keep you away from hypertension and kidney stones. Another thing is you have to drink a lot of water if you eat salty food, okay? So what I do is I ask my patients, look, cook without salt. And then in order for you to make sure that you have enough salt in your body, you still need salt, that one teaspoon divided into three, okay? So one third, you pour it over your food when it's already on your plate. And that makes sure that you only have one third teaspoon salt for that meal. Do the same thing for lunch, do the same thing for dinner. And you essentially limit your salt to one teaspoon a day. Uh, when it comes to sugar, apart from, you know, if you're already diabetic, okay, you don't want to keep eating high sugar foods or at least simple sugar foods like processed sugar, candies, cakes, right? Donuts. 
because then you increase the volume or we call the, the, the load of sugar in your body. Uh, so it increases the load of sugar. Um, and of course, that'll cause you to not be able to control your diabetes. So if you're already diabetic and you still continue to eat lots of sugar, even if you don't eat lots of fat, you could still trigger a spike in sugar because by shifting to a very low fat diet, it takes time. It takes about a few weeks before you can actually bring your sugars down. So while you have not reversed your diabetes yet, it is very advisable not to eat uh, um, simple sugar foods. Fruits, no problem, but you know, plain sugar, very dangerous. Also sugar is anti-immune system. If you eat a lot of sugar, especially during the time of pandemic, okay, you want to keep your immune system in tip top shape. If you eat a lot of sugary foods, you will destroy your immune system. You will at least kill the cells that produce antibodies to beat COVID-19 or whatever infection there is. Uh, when it comes to, uh, what was the last thing? Fat, okay? We already know the answer, right? Fat makes you fat and sick. It also produces insulin resistance, which causes type two diabetes. And by the way, these three things, fat, sugar, and salt are also addicting. And this is why we can't keep away from it. We want to taste it. We want to have that flavor of salt, of fat, and of sugar, because essentially it satisfies a dopamine pathway that you know rewards us. You feel good when you eat these things. And you want to keep eating them because they make you feel good. And that's why these foods are addicting. So you want to be able to control yourself when it comes to these sweet, salty, and fatty foods. Sorry, that was like a lot of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for making complicated things very simple. Um, the next question here is, are we to completely devoid ourselves or uh, stop taking oil? And if not, then what is the kind of oil that you recommend that is healthy and good? Yeah, so I really don't recommend oil at all. There's no kind of oil that's safer than the, the other, right? Uh, even if it's olive oil, can you believe that? That's why some uh, vegans, you know, they don't even eat, they don't eat any type of animal product, not even eggs, not even milk, not even cheese. And yet they're diabetic. And the reason why they're diabetic is because, you know, they have a nice, healthy, fresh salad, and then they pour half a cup of olive oil on it. That olive oil will cause the insulin resistance that we see in regular diabetics, even though they are not, uh, even though they're vegans. So, so the idea really is if you, especially if you want to reverse your diabetes, is to avoid oil at all costs, whether it's from animal sources or whether it's from plant sources, oil is the culprit. Maybe if you've already completely reversed your diabetes and you've been off your medications for, let's say, three years, four years, okay, once in a while, a little bit of, you know, a tiny bit of oil in your food won't do much harm. But remember, uh, over time, if you keep doing it, if you keep adding oil to your food, eventually you will again develop insulin resistance and develop your diabetes. Thank you. Our next question here is, what is your view about diabetic rice that are low in GI? Um, right. So we're talking about glycemic index. Uh, we don't even need to. Uh, we don't even need to uh, watch the the glycemic index anymore when it comes to type two diabetes because we understand that um, it is not the glycemic index that matters but rather more the glycemic load, okay? So when I say load, that means the amount of simple sugars that you take into your body. Rice in general is okay, but unpolished rice is even better because you have all that fiber in it to prevent the sugar from spiking, from, from, from just getting absorbed really quickly into our bloodstream. So what you want to control is uh, the amount of sugar, simple sugar, so there's, there's two different types of sugar, okay? There's complex sugars or complex carbohydrates. And when we say complex carbohydrates, these are the starches. So rice has a lot of starch, but it's in a starch form. So in, in other words, 
These are long chains of carbohydrates that have to be broken down by your system. So it takes a longer time for us to absorb these, these, these carbohydrates. Whereas simple carbohydrates, your table sugar, you don't even need to digest that anymore. If you put that in your food, that sugar, as soon as you swallow it, just gets absorbed into your system. So it's really the simple sugars, the simple carbohydrates that we want to avoid. Rice is perfect. Unpolished rice is even better, okay? Go ahead, eat that. Eat your, even pasta is okay, all right? As long as you don't put a lot of oil on the pasta, or if you, if possible, don't even put oil. Uh, instead, make your sauce saucier so your pasta doesn't dry up, okay? So that's how we do it. We use a lot of water. We use a lot of moisture in order for us to keep our food moist and yummy. And, you know, with moisture, you can taste the food more. So you need the moisture. That's how we teach people how to cook. All right. Thank you. Moving on, we have this other question. We see a lot of multigrain flour, multigrain bread, and all kinds of things. The question is, is it healthy? And is it beneficial to eat all these multigrain things? Okay. Multigrain flour is perfect. Okay. Um, multigrain cereal is perfect, but when you look at bread, remember bread in order to make bread, they still use a lot of oil. Okay. So if you can create bread without oil, instead of oil, for example, if you're making a banana cake or a banana loaf, right? I don't know if you have that in your country, but we have, um, banana bread, we call it instead of using oil for the banana bread. In order for the banana bread to become a uh, tasty and moist, we add more water. And banana itself helps with the moisture. It keeps the bread moist so that we don't need to use oil. And the banana bread, the banana loaf is still soft. So if you want to cook bread, you want to use things like um, uh, ground uh, flaxseed, which could substitute not only for the egg, but also for the oil, and then you just use more water. That's what we do. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question here is kind of interesting. Hey, sir, I don't eat often, and I assume it's oil or uh, meat, or only after 10 to 15 days, you know, once in a while, I used to have it. Is that a problem? Do I know that, it, that uh, I, I have balanced my diet? Sorry, um, I didn't quite get the question. After 15 days, so you, you fast between that? or no, I think uh, the, the individual is emphasizing on eating maybe consumption of oil. Yeah, consumption, of oil. It. consumption of oil or maybe meat. So it's only once in 15 days or so. So the individual is asking, how do I know if my diet is balanced or not? Yeah. Okay, so remember the, the power plate diagram? that I showed you, let me just share it real quick again uh, for everybody's sake. Okay, so fruits, grains, beans, and vegetables, right? If you have those on your plate in roughly the same proportions, one is to one is to one is to one. So if you have one cup of whole grains, one cup of vegetables, one cup of beans, and roughly uh, the amount of one cup of fruits, then you are eating enough food and enough nutrients for that meal. Now do that every single day for every single meal. And you know, once in a while, if you want some meat, put the meat on the edge of the plate, right? If it falls off the table, then don't even pick it up. But once in a while, you could probably eat some meat, uh, but you have to be very um, disciplined to do that because not a lot of people will eventually be able to control themselves. You know, they eat the meat, they crave for it, so they start. They end up eating a lot of meat, and again, uh, the meat increases your chance for developing diabetes. So, use meat, I would say, as a condiment instead of the main meal. So, this is what um, people in Okinawa, Japan, do. This is what people in Sardinia, Italy, do. Okay, the reason why they live long lives and they're very healthy is because they eat mostly plants, and then they use meat more of as as a condiment, just to kind of flavor the food you know, get some texture into the food. That's how they eat their meat and even their fish and, and, and chicken for that matter. 
Okay. If you eat this way, balance out the fruits, grains, beans, and vegetables, then you're good to go. You have all the nutrients you need. And then if you want to add some meat, then again, use it just as a condiment. All right. Wow, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that's an encouragement to some of us who are not veg here, that a veg doesn't have to be in life. Anyway, let's move on here. There's a question here in India. We consume a lot of uh, milk products like yogurt and curd, and you know we have all these things. The question here is, it says in, in North India, we consume a lot of unsalted, clear butter. Is it safe? Yeah. That's probably why you have the highest rates of diabetes in the world <laughs> because <laughs> of those ingredients. I know they're, I know that it'd probably be hard to adjust your taste buds, but we've, I mean, I cook a lot of Indian foods. I've, I have a lot of Indian friends, so they teach me how to cook their food and how to, you know, mix all the spices and cook the spices, etc. So what I do, what I did, and this I do for my patients as well, is teach them how to cook the same kind of food. The, the, the effect and the flavor is still the same, but without the oil, okay? So it's a matter of finding a technique to be able to bring out the flavors without the oil. And there's a lot of techniques to do that. Um, again, as much as possible, try to avoid the fatty foods like the butter. G is part of your food as well, I understand. And G is very high in fat. Uh, so I don't know how to substitute G <laughs> or is that how you pronounce it? G, 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 how do you pronounce it? G, G, G. Yes. okay. So, so G, um, uh, I don't know how to substitute or what to substitute for G, but again, when we cook and I ask my friends to taste the food, they say it tastes like curry. It tastes like, you know, whatever, whatever taste the food is supposed to be uh, as for as as an indian dish it tastes exactly like the indian dish but without the oil without the fat so i think we just have to uh get re-educated on how to prepare our food without the fat and still come up with a wonderful delicious meal or dish yeah i am sure that that is possible and but that might not be easy but i think there is if there is a will there is always a way out right Correct. so and the next question i think we're running out of time but i think we have just one or two more questions and that is how to care for my feet if i am a diabetic how to take care of you i think you made a mention that you need to care for your feet yeah. otherwise you know so the question is how do i care for them? so if you're already a diabetic and uh, if, you, if you don't have any wounds yet, that's a good thing, right? You don't have any wounds. Try not to get wounds on your foot if you're already a diabetic. So always wear thick socks, always wear shoes that you know, have, uh, so some, of, some of these people wear shoes where the toe bit is reinforced so that when you kick something by accident, it won't actually hurt your toes. Uh, but again, the best thing to care for your feet is not to become a diabetic, right? Eventually reverse your diabetes because as you reverse your diabetes, then the atherosclerosis, it's atherosclerosis that causes diabetic foot, by the way. When your blood vessels are blocked by cholesterol so that there's no more blood supply going to the feet, that's when the feet start to die, okay? So no matter how much you care for your foot, you know, having soft socks, having reinforced shoes that will help prevent your feet from getting bruised or, or, or wounded. If your diabetes continues, even without a wound, your foot will eventually become gangrenous because eventually there will be zero blood supply to your feet. And no, it doesn't matter if you, if you have a wound or not, if, a part of your body has no blood supply, eventually it'll become black. It will rot because it is literally dead. There's no more blood going to the foot. So what you want to do is really reverse your diabetes. Eat a healthy diet, a diet without oil, reverse your diabetes, and you won't even have to worry about your foot. Okay, I've had patients with diabetic foot. Uh, in other words, they, they could not feel anything. There was, there was literally neuropathy on their foot 
They could not feel the socks. They could not feel uh, if they hit a, a hard object or a soft object, they would not know. And after six months of being diabetes free, okay? After six months of being diabetes free, they quickly became diabetes free. I mean, it was between uh, one to two months that they were able to bring down their blood sugars so that they did not need medications. And after six months, they could start feeling the very fibers of the socks that they wear. That's how powerful, you know, reversal of diabetes can help your feet return back to normal, can help your nervous system return back to normal because there's now blood supply to the feet. Once the atherosclerosis is reversed. I think this is the last question and that is, is keto diet good? A keto diet is very high in fat and low in, low in carbohydrates, right? So essentially, when you eat a ketogenic diet, you are becoming 100% insulin resistant. Yes, you will, as you lose the weight, because a ketogenic diet, um, instead of glucose being the, being the source of your energy, your system, because there's no glucose, there's no carbohydrates being eaten, eventually will find the emergency source, which is your fat stores. And so it starts to burn your fat. You get thin really quick, which is a good thing. But the bad thing about that is uh, your blood sugars will come down as you get thin, but eventually it will plateau. Okay. You are now, you've now used up all your fat stores. And what will happen is uh, you become keto acidotic, which is very dangerous. As soon as you get to the point where you are keto acidotic, within 24 hours, you're dead. I have, I, I do not joke when, when it comes to this. That is why a ketogenic diet, there's only two um, diseases or conditions that will indicate a ketogenic diet. Number one, if you are morbidly obese and you need to cut down your obesity very fast because otherwise you increase your risk for other problems, then absolutely uh, go on a ketogenic diet. But remember, you need medical supervision. You need a nutritionist on board. You need a lifestyle medicine physician on board to monitor your, your, in, to monitor your decrease in weight and to monitor your blood, whether you're developing ketoacidosis. Okay. The next condition is a refractory epilepsy. This is an epilepsy where no matter what type of medication you are taking, it will not help the epilepsy. You continue to get seizures, which eventually can kill you, right? So what they do is they put these people in a, uh, on a ketogenic diet because the ketogenic diet helps um, calm down the firing of neurons in the brain that cause the epileptic seizures. So those are the only two conditions where a ketogenic diet is uh, recommended or indicated, as we would say in medicine. The rest is just vanity. <laughs> People want to get thin <laughs> and sexy. I mean, think about it. By eating a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, you're increasing your risk of getting a heart attack of getting a stroke, you're literally creating diabetes so that you cannot tolerate even a small amount of sugar. If you are on a ketogenic diet, you are 100%, uh, you're creating 100% insulin resistance so that you've just taken a small amount of sugar and your sugar will spike because you're so resistant to, to insulin. Okay, so even when you transition, let's say you're morbidly obese and you're on a ketogenic diet, and you've already reached your ideal weight, then the doctor will still have to adjust your food very slowly to introduce carbohydrates. That's how hard it is to be on a ketogenic diet. You have to be monitored all the time. Otherwise you can develop ketoacidosis and die. There's no point in becoming sexy if you're gonna be sexy and dead, right? <laughs> Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to look good in the coffin because you have a smaller, thinner coffin? No. The best thing to do if you want to lose weight is to lose weight on a plant-based whole food diet because you're losing weight naturally. High fiber food, very little calories, okay? 
you're eating a lot of complex carbohydrates. So you're boosting your metabolism and you're able to um, do sports, do exercise to bring down that weight, burn those calories. Okay. All right. Yeah. Trust Yes, I'm sure the one who have asked has been clarified of doubt. Uh, we have just one more question that has come in. What about mm-hmm. milk and yogurt? Like I said, I have the whole afternoon for you guys. <laughs> so don't, don't worry about what it. What about milk and yogurt? Is it good? Is it? Um, remember, I mean, think about it. I, I was a biologist before I became a medical doctor. So human beings happen to be the only mammal that drinks milk from a different species. The milk of a cow was designed for, by God, (laughs) for their baby cows, right? If I was thirsty one day and you saw me on the side of the road drinking from a cow, the milk from a cow, you'd think I was crazy, right? If I was sucking on the teat of that cow to, to refresh myself, you'd think I was crazy. And yet that's what we do indirectly. What we do is we put the milk in a, in a glass and then drink it. So the milk from a cow was never designed to be consumed by human beings. Uh, In fact, adult cows don't even drink milk, don't even drink cow milk, right? So it's quite um, illogical and even unscientific and very unhealthy for human beings, a different species of of mammal, to drink the milk from a different mammal. We're supposed to drink mother's milk while we're babies, and once we're weaned from that milk, then we start eating the right food, which are fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans designed for us to be eaten uh, by God, designed our bodies to, to eat those types of food. Uh, that's why we should eat those kinds of food. Now, if you really, really insist on uh, drinking milk, um, then I would, of course, recommend the very low fat or even no fat milk. Uh, but the reason why people get addicted, I saw a, a I saw a, um, a chat, a message here that Dr. Ashwini loves cheese. <laughs> you know what? The last thing I was able to remove from my diet was actually cheese. So I understand Dr. Ashwini here who says he loves cheese. And the reason why we get addicted to cheese is because cow's milk, even mother's milk, okay? Anybody's, um, any mammal's milk especially during the first few months of a child's life, first, in fact, year of a child's life or an animal's life, the milk is very high in uh, morphine. We call it casomorphine. And that increases the bond between the baby and the mother because the baby is literally addicted to the mother's milk because of the casomorphine in the milk. Imagine the milk of a cow concentrating that and creating cheese. The casomorphine in cheese is so high that we literally get addicted to cheese no matter how bad it smells, okay? (laughs) And that's why we get addicted to cheese because of the morphine, the casomorphine in cheese. As the baby gets older, the casomorphine in the milk of the mother gets lesser. So there's lesser concentration of milk. And that's why eventually the baby doesn't want to drink the milk anymore because that's a time where they don't need the milk. They're already big. They can now eat normal food. And that's why babies get weaned off the mother's milk. The reason why we can't get weaned off cheese is because cheese has concentrated casomorphine. It causes us to be addicted to it. And that's why it's very hard to, it's very difficult to really um, break the addiction from cheese. It's one of the last things I was able to, was able to take away from my diet. And as a last thing, if, if you if you have any yes. more questions, I'm willing to I'm willing to answer them. But just as a, a last note, if, if this is our last question, if you really want to become healthy and break your habits, break your bad habits, as as Christians, as Seventh Day Adventist Christians, I know some of us here are probably um, Muslim or, or Hindu. There's a small um, population in this group that may be that. One of the best things to be able to break a habit is to ask God to help you. It's a spiritual thing, you know. You have to have a drive to be able to break those habits. And apart from learning, I think we need spiritual health. We need spiritual um, help in order to break these habits. 
that's how my mom was able to break her habit of eating fish. Okay, so we need that spiritual help as well, apart from the education and the will, your will, we also need God's will. And I think it, God wants you to be healthy. So, you know, ask him for help and he will definitely help you. You're muted, Pastor. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that light. I think we can either continue to choose to be a baby eating cheese and <laughs> or kind of choose to grow up. Um, I think um, I think there's a statement here and that is, uh, I think it's in relation to the consumption of milk. The question is, okay. then how do we eat our cereals? Then how do we eat our cereals? Oh, wonderful question. <laughs> do you know that we have plant-based milks? They, they taste even better than milk because it doesn't have that. Uh, you know, when I, when I stopped drinking milk for a long time, and then somebody gave me a drink with milk in it, I immediately tasted that cowy kind of smell that we get from milk. You don't, you don't actually, you get used to it so much that you don't realize that what we're drinking is a fluid from the udders of cows. I mean, if you think about it, how disgusting can that be? We don't drink dog's milk, right? If we drink cow's milk, we might as well drink dog's milk, giraffe's milk. Right, it's the same thing. It's it's milk from a mammal, and yet we're so accustomed to the smell of milk that we don't notice it. So there are plant-based milks. There's soy milk. There's oat milk. There's different types of nut milks like cashew, almond milk. We can create milk from plant-based foods. They taste great, and they can be used in whatever we use for milk. We can bake bread using soy milk. We can bake bread using cashew milk. And when you use cashew milk, by the way, in baking bread, you don't even need oil because cashew has natural oil in it, okay? <laughs> that makes the bread soft. So when you bake, instead of using milk and eggs and butter and oil, use cashew. Cashew milk is so easy to create, so easy to make. All you do is soak the cashew for about four hours, okay, in, in drinking water. And once it's nice and soaked and soft, you blend it in water and depending on how thick you want the milk to be, then just add more water. If you want to, if you want it to be more thinner milk, then you add more water. If you want to want it to be more creamy, like even create cream, then you put a little bit of water and it becomes nice and creamy. And you can use that for whatever dish you need cream for. Cashew milk and cashew cream oh, is really good. Great. Okay. I think we have come to the end of the question, Dr. Maniz, and thank you so much for patiently answering the questions and clarifying things. No problem. Uh, sometime back, a friend of mine told me, what kind of food do you eat? Without oil, without this, without that, that's a Stone Age food. That is an uncivilized <laughs> food. <laughs> but I think uh, today's presentation have really told me that food without oil is actually the best food for us. Hopefully that's not an uncivilized food. Um, thank you so much. I think this has been a wonderful, productive season, and we really appreciate all the things that you have shared with us. And I'm sure everyone present here this, this morning and this afternoon has been blessed. And it is our sincere prayer, Dr. Menes, that God bless your ministry, God um, bless your family. And I'm sure that this is not the end. I think this is the beginning of uh, relationship between you and Spicer. And we look forward to a time when you will be able to come and visit us physically here. That will be great. We, we welcome you to Spicy Campus and I'm sure that your presence will be a great blessing. So let's look forward to that. And thank you, Mr. Hami, for organizing this uh, program, the church, and God bless all. Yes, I hand yeah. over the time to Mr. Hami. Can I say something real quick? Um, oh, yes. I posted a website that might be able to help you guys, pcrm.org. There are a ton of resources there, even recipes that you can try for yourself, just to give you an idea on how to cook uh, plant-based foods. And then maybe you can apply the principles, the techniques, so that you can actually produce um, uh, like wonderful Indian recipes with the principles of a plant-based whole food diet, okay? Without having to use oil or, or cream or, or 
ghee or whatever and still produce wonderful uh tasty food okay so www.pcrm.org all right thank you so much doctor i would like to hand over the time to pastor to hand over the certificate of appreciation Pastor, I think your mic is uh, muted. Sorry, sorry. We would like to thank and appreciate very much to Dr. Manes for his presentation today. On behalf of all the church members and those who are presenting here, we would like to give a token of uh, appreciation in the form of certificate. I would like to just read this certificate. Yeah. Certificate of Appreciation. This certificate is presented to Dr. Johan Kim T. Manez for his valuable presentation in the webinar, Reversing Diabetes, conducted on December 5, 2021, organized by Spicer Adventist University House of Prayer in collaboration with the Department of Education and Office of Research and Innovation, Spicer Adventist University. Pune, India, signed by Senior Pastor and Director of Health and Temperance uh, Spicer Church and Dr. Maxwell Balraj, Head of the Department of Education of SAU. Doctor, we hope that you'll accept this uh, humble certificate and we pray Absolutely. that God wow. will continue to bless your ministry and bless your family so that you'll be able to work more and more for him. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Can I request a, a picture with you guys? Like a sure. screenshot with everybody? Sure. I'd like, like to save this, this, this moment. It's, it's just so wonderful. Yeah. Wow. Oh, everybody, please kindly uh, turn our cameras on. Uh, we travel to Philippines. Oh, yeah, wonderful, beautiful faces. <laughs> Absolutely great. Okay, so so let me just go ahead and take a screenshot. Okay, ready? Big smiles, everyone. One, two. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we have come to the end of this webinar. We wish to have more time, Dr. Manes, but you know, time will not allow us to be together for so long. Uh, sure. I would like to request um, Dr. Coberson to kindly close us with the closing prayer, and after which I'll request Dr. Maxwell to just give us a closing remark. Okay, shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation through Dr. Manis. Thank you for the information we have got about diabetes. And I believe that there are some of us who are having this disease. May you help all of us that we will be able to overcome and reverse this diabetes in our lives. And perhaps some of us are on the verge of getting it, but we pray that we will be prevented by taking precautions and the valuable instructions that we have received today, that we all can be more healthy and through that health, we can serve you better. And we continue to pray for Dr. Manis as he ministers to different people, wherever he is in the Philippines or in everywhere around the world, may you increase his talents, may you increase his abilities, his influence, that he will be able to bring more happiness, joy and health to people. Thank you so much once again for the wonderful time we had had today. Bless us all as we depart from here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Hello. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Manas for, on behalf of uh, each and every one of us who have participated here. Uh, it's an eye-opening uh, program, I should say. When we go to a physician, they will say, don't eat this, that, and they give medicine and they will uh, ask us to follow. But uh, the root cause and how diabetes are forming in our body uh, he, you have explained uh, very uh, meticulously and that has helped and we have put in the concept and uh, unless we practice and uh, nothing is going to help us 
and uh, uh, I uh, when I'm when I, I attended this one from the beginning, I was thinking to start a, a center, a sanatorium, health sanatorium. So uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Hama is uh, ready to do that one. And uh, I am also planning, uh, doctor, uh, to bring other universities for this uh, kind of session. So if you can uh, uh, give more information on this uh, topic, I can invite and arrange uh, uh, asking other universities, uh, education department and other department to join so that everyone can be benefited because uh, most of us are teachers and uh, preachers here. Uh, we, I, I hope uh, this health message as we tell the uh, good news, this will be the uh, real good news uh, in the starting point. And uh, I, I also thank our church as senior pastor for uh, joining and helping us in this uh, program. And I also thank our uh, uh, health and temperance uh, director, uh, Mr. Mashumi and uh, Mr. Hamai for organizing and putting everything together. And I also thank uh, Dr. S uh, Jessen for sharing uh, the Zoom ID and uh, all others, uh, Dr. Barekhan, uh, just coordinating the question. Doctor, let me tell you the first session of your presentation and question answer session were equally important and you gave a lot of tips how to make uh, um, plant-based uh, milk and other recipes and uh, clearing from our mind all the doubts uh, that we had and uh, misconcept that we had. Uh, so next time when you have a session like this, please um, spend much more time so that uh, uh, many more uh, uh, questions will be answered. By you. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank, you. thank you so much, Doctor. You're welcome. All right, Doctor Manes. Thank you so much.